So we are getting near the end of, uh, at the end in, of Second Timothy, and uh, I've been really challenged by what the Lord has taught me during our study of these two books. I was thinking that it's easy for us to, uh, for the vision to become blurred when we are very active in church things, uh, things related to the, to, the, to the church. And especially when we're a small church, you know, there's a lot of uh, logistics and activities and things that happen. But those must never, and those are important, and that's good. I'm so thankful that we see each other, we interact with each other, not just on Sunday, but on Wednesday and other times during the week we're in each other's homes. And that's great, and that's wonderful, and that's the body of Christ living and active and functioning as an organism. But that must never distract us from the real purpose that God has placed us here, of which these activities and the planning and, you know, putting logistics together like we had our planning meeting, you know, those are important. But those are just an aid to help us towards the goal, and we must never lose sight of the goal. And for me, First and Second Timothy has been, for, as we've walked through it, as I've taught some through it and learned uh, through it, it's been a reminder of the goal. It's been a reminder of Paul the Apostle reminding Timothy, whom he's handing the torch to, as it were, of this goal. He says, don't forget the purpose. He begins the writing. Let me start by showing you that verse. 1 Timothy 1, he says, first of all, the goal. He keeps talking about this goal, and later on in 2 Timothy 2, in those verses we read as well, is this you, striving, and um, he, he who um, wants mastery, who so runs in a race, wants to gain the crown, and he must obey the rules. Keep that goal in mind. He talks about a soldier that doesn't get entangled with the things of this earth because he wants to please his master. So this sense of a goal and kind of sharpening, that's kind of what I see Paul doing to Timothy during this, in the, in the course of these letters that he says, sharpening Timothy's vision towards that goal. And he says that, in verse 5, the goal of all of my teaching, Timothy, the goal of my instruction, of our instruction, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So uh, this is the th thought that the Lord gave to me a, a few days ago, actually, earlier this week, is ne never get so caught up with trying to do church. You follow what I mean by trying to do church? Because there's a lot of logistics and we think, okay, it's Wednesday evening, I've got to go to the Bible study, or Sunday morning, we're going to go to the meeting, the morning meeting, or whatever we do, it can easily, if we allow it, if we look to man and try to do it man's way, it can become our efforts to try to do church. The reality is none of us can ever do church. The Lord is building His church, and if we align ourselves with His Holy Spirit, the train and the movement of His Holy Spirit on this earth, He will build His church. He is building His church, and it's up to us to let Him use us in that way. That's the reminder that the Lord gave me. And this, I see, is the recurring theme that comes through this book. First of all, he says, I see that Paul exalts Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ on earth, a man who came down to this earth with a purpose. And you know, I was thinking in Isaiah, well, let's turn back there. This thought came to me as I was sitting here, and I thought it will tie in with what I want to share. Back in Isaiah chapter 9, in those verses that we were reading, it was prompted by something Phil was sharing towards the end of the Bible study, Isaiah 9. Um, and amidst all this destruction, he draws this picture of Jesus Christ coming in verse 6. He says, For a child will be born to us, and we know that was prophesying about Jesus. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then you get Jesus coming along like a little carpenter, making tables and doing whatever, doing, going about doing good. And no wonder the Pharisees missed it. Because I picture the Pharisees reading it in exactly the same sense of awe, oh, and this is the Messiah that's coming. And then there's Jesus, insignificant looking. Because they didn't understand that the power and the zeal of the Lord and the, His being a wonderful counselor and the Prince of Peace and the throne of David was a spiritual kingdom. Something that you would miss if you were looking for the fanfare. And that's the thought that, I, that came to me as I was sitting there. Is the reason most so-called Christians miss it most people who read the Word of God miss 
I think, miss Jesus in the same way that those who read the, the Word of God in Jesus' day when He was here on this earth missed it. It's because they're looking for a fanfare. They're looking for a Messiah who will come and overthrow the Roman government and give them a kingdom on this earth. But Jesus was coming to show you, show us a quiet strength, a spiritual power, a, 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 a kingdom and a throne and no end of the increase of his government that was manifest when he hung on the cross, seemingly helpless. Do you see that Jesus Christ now walking on the, at 12 years old, uh, uh, engaging with the, with, the, with the teachers of the law and then going back and living in subjection to his daddy and mommy? This is the same Jesus that was described this way. No wonder they said, how could this be the Messiah? We know what Isaiah said the Messiah would look like. Who is this guy? We know his mom and we know his brothers and his sisters. Can't be him. It's God. They didn't even think he came from the line of David, even though we know Matthew and Luke record he came from the line of David. And it's easy to miss it if we're looking for that fanfare. And I see that that's what Paul is telling Timothy. He's saying, Listen, Jesus Christ came because he says this, first of all, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Let's go back here and I'd like to point out a few verses in these two books as we've studied them that have stood out for me as the, uh, as the message, as it's kind of, if I could identify the message that I've taken away from our study of this book. In 1 Timothy 3, he says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, I think if you talk to the average Christian today, if you talk to the average Pharisee in Jesus' day, I think they would have thought that they had an idea of godliness. Well, godliness, yeah, it's this, you, thou shalt obey this, and thou shalt keep the law, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and all these things. In fact, there were, there were uh, you know, different people who came to Jesus at different times and quoted the law to him, and he says, yeah, you're right. You're not far from the kingdom of heaven, he told one, one of them at one point. The, the rich young ruler came along and says, I've kept all of these things. But Paul says very, very clearly to Timothy, this is Paul, the apostle Paul himself, telling Timothy, who by this point is a pretty, pretty mature young co-worker of Paul. He's still probably in his 40s or so when, when Paul wrote this book to him, maybe late 30s, early 40s, something like that. And he's telling him, telling, telling Paul, Timothy, the same Timothy about whom he said, this is my best co-worker. He knows these things, but listen, Timothy, this is a mystery. Godliness is not as simple as you think it is. If you're trying to explain it in all these cute little three points or five points or nice little uh, chronological, you'll miss it. It's a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. And he goes on to explain that mystery somewhat. He says, he who was revealed in the flesh. This Jesus Christ who was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah came looking very simple in flesh. And you could touch him and you, you could behold his glory. And you could, uh, like Jesus told his disciples, come and see. You know, here John the Baptist had told the disciples, this is the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And they were curious to see, what does the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world look like? What does his bedroom look like? What does his living room look like? And I bet if they actually went, because Jesus said, come and see. Come, let's go to my house. It's right there on the, on the other street. You mean God would actually live on that street? And he came from Nazareth, from which no good thing can come. And he said, come and see. It looks very ordinary, but I'm going to show you a mystery of godliness. The he who was revealed in the flesh. God revealed in the flesh. And this is, I think, what Paul is upholding to Timothy. He goes on also in 2 Timothy 2. Look at this verse. Verse 8. 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. He says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Who? Descendant of David. You can trace his lineage. He's one of us. He's God, yes, but he also came in flesh. And this same Jesus Christ who, God, who came in the flesh was used of God. And I see that, that Paul's challenge to Timothy and the challenge to us, each one of us, through the Holy Spirit is that God is looking for somebody like that. Paul, I think he uses his own life as an example, and we've studied the life of Paul in our study of First and Second Timothy, of the kind of life he lived. Paul said, Lord, here I am. Use me, essentially. You can take me through whatever, whatever circumstance, whatever pain, whatever suffering, whatever um, thorn in the flesh, all of these things, here I am. You can still use me. In the same way that Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, made himself available to the Father. He came here not to do his own will, but to do the will of the Father. And Paul said, likewise, I'm here not to do my own will, to do the will of the Father. Now you. That's why I've titled my, the, this message, You Man of God. He tells Timothy at one point in 1 Timothy 2, you man of God. That's the challenge. That's the word I felt the Lord speaking to me as I studied these verses again. You man of God. You woman of God. 
You man of God, you woman of God. Now it's up to us. Let me show you a passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22. The reason this is important is I think that very often we can look at Scripture and think, oh, that's great. Jesus lived that wonderful life. Thank you for living such a good life for me. Paul lived such a good example. Look at, or we can read the stories of missionaries or uh, biographies of godly men and women that serve God and think, wow, look at that. I'm so blessed by that. But it does nothing to actually change the way I live. If the result of my reading the life of Jesus and reading about the life of Paul and seeing the challenges that Paul gives to Timothy is that I, I continue to be self-centered and selfish and think about my needs and poor me, poor me, poor me, I missed it. And that's the sad thing. I know that I was like that for many years. I missed it. I, I appreciated Jesus. I was a, an admirer of Jesus. And look at Paul. Wow, man, man of God. And this other uh, C.T. Studd and uh, Hudson Taylor, all these wonderful people. And I get excited when I read their biographies. But in my day-to-day -day circumstance, I'm still just as self-centered, still thinking about myself. In my relationship with my wife, it's still me, my way or the highway. It's still uh, my interests and my, myself manifesting itself. But what I see when I study the life of Jesus, what I see when I examine the life of Paul and I see the life of Timothy and the biography of men, biographies of men and women that were used by God is that they put self to death. And they gave themselves up completely to the purpose of God and he would use them. And now he says, now what will you do with it? What about you, dear brother, dear sister? You man of God, you woman of God. Ezekiel 22. Now, you know, Ezekiel was in Babylon, in a part of the captivity of the Jews, and he was prophesying both to the Jews who were there in captivity with him, as well as to the other Jews that still remained back there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had not yet been completely destroyed. And in the midst of this prophecy, you see, it's similar, you know, like, kind of like we've been studying in Isaiah, but it's much later. Verse 23, Ezekiel 22, verse 23, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, this is to God's people, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets. And I, like we've been seeing in Isaiah, this, I see a lot of peril to the condition of God's people, those who call themselves Christians today. There is a conspiracy of her prophets, those who should be responsible for pointing them to God. There is a conspiracy of her preachers, her teachers, her evangelists, her prophets in her midst, like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in the midst of her. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the profane. They have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they hide their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. Her princes within her, those who were called to be their leaders, are like wolves tearing the prey by shedding blood and destroying lives in order to get dishonest gain. And her prophets, look at how he keeps talking about the leaders, the ones who should have been doing the protecting. Her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and div div divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery. And they have wronged the poor and needy and have oppressed the sojourner without justice. Can you imagine the heart of God as he looks out at his people? He thinks back to how he preserved mankind and gave a promise to Adam and Eve. And then preserved mankind through Noah. And then gave the promise of the sea to Abraham, his friend. And then preserved mankind with the throne of David. Established David on his throne. And he's looking forward to Christ. But he looks at the condition of his people and sees this. And then he says, verse 30, And I search for one person. I search for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Thus, therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord God. I searched for a man. This is what I hear Paul telling Timothy. God is searching for men and women likewise today in our generation. When you see so much of the profanity and the uncleanness and the unholiness that's creeping into Christendom, into people who are preaching God's word and condoning things that are the furthest thing from God's word. In the midst of that, God is looking for a man. And 
He's not looking for people just who stand up in the pulpit and preach it, or people who have other gifts, outward gifts. There's no mention to me, as I read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, the call is to every single one of us. You man of God, you woman of God, will you be that man or that woman? In the church, in your home, in your marriage, where there's a gap, will you be the one? Now, it will take your putting your life down there. Have you pictured what it means to stand in the gap where there's a gap in the wall? Let's say there's a, this is the wall that's protecting me from the enemy, and here's the other part of the wall that's protecting me and the enemy, and there's a gap. And if you choose to stand there in the gap, it could mean the destruction of your flesh. It could be painful. Those arrows that, are, that, that, that won't get through the wall will come at you. You might suffer. And we read about that. We studied about the suffering of Paul and how Paul says, evil men will come, the, the days will get dark, and you will have to suffer. You will get persecutions. All who live godly will suffer. Why? Because those godly men are trying to stand in the gap and defend the authority and stand in the authority by which God has placed them there. I appeal to you, dear men, husbands, do that for your wives and for your children. Fathers, mothers, do that for your children. Stand in the gap because God is looking for a man. God is looking for a woman. This is a fight. This is a, uh, an, an active battle that we're walking through. And if we take the responsibility, God is on our side. And we'll get to that in a moment. But he says you must have faith. And to me, the books of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, as, I've, as we've studied it, and it was really challenged by what I saw and heard in Phil's message last week too, that it's the walk of faith. It's the trusting, uh, trusting God, like our Father, trusting Him. If you have faith, I also thought of that verse in, you know what it says about Jesus in His hometown? Let me show you in Matthew 13. I think these are some of the saddest words in the, go in the Gospels, actually. Matthew 13, verse 53. Matthew 13, 53, it came about that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there and coming to his hometown, he began teaching them in their synagogue so that they became astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? I've watched him make tables and uh, he has to work just like everybody else. Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did these, this man get all these things and they took offense at him. But Jesus said to him, to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own household. And he did not. And in, Matthew, uh, in Mark, I think he says he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And I think about how many who read First and Second Timothy and see their responsibility. And if you hear God's calling over your life to be that man or that woman that will stand in the gap in your marriage, in your home, in, the response, in your workplace, that you will stand in the gap? If, it, if the response is unbelief, then God can't do anything. I look at it this way, that unbelief is what ties God's hands in your life. He'll do many other miracle things. His hands are not really tied. He'll do many other great things in the lives of others who have faith. But in your home, if you think, well, my situation is too far gone. I've messed up too far. That's saying, Lord, you can come into my house, but I'm going to put these uh, strings, these, this belt. I'm going to tie your hands uh, as you come into my house. Do you know that, men, that that's what unbelief is? When we operate in unbelief, in doubt, in worry about our lives and what God's going to do, that he's going to accomplish his purpose in our lives, we're saying, yes, yes, Lord Jesus, you're welcome to my home, but you can't do anything. His hands are tied because of unbelief. That's what happened to the town, in the town of Capernaum. He, he went in there and says, well, I'd love to do wonderful works in your, I'd love to heal your sick. I'd love to raise your dead. I'd love to do those mighty works of power. But guess what? You don't have faith. My hands are tied. And so often we allow it to be like that in our homes because we don't trust God. I, I've started to see First and Second Timothy as the books of how to make our faith practical. You know, you heard about the chapter of faith, that's Hebrews 11. But I was intrigued and I actually did a you know, little bit of research to, this, to discover how often the word faith is mentioned. It's almost like 30 times, I think, the word faith is mentioned in First and Second Timothy. And next to uh, probably the book of Romans and Hebrews, which also talk about faith a lot, a lot and they're longer books. This book talks, I don't know that there's any other book that, books that talk about faith as much. But I see that it's a practical application. How do you make your faith practical? Yes, I see the faith that Hebrews talks about and how Jesus is the example of my faith. But how do I do it? I've learned that from First and Second Timothy, and I hope you have as well. So I, I would like to point out three faith lessons that I, I, as I reflected on what we have studied, it's probably been a year, maybe two years, 
that we've been re studying through First and Second Timothy, going verse by verse, passage by passage. And as it has challenged my faith, and especially in light of these last verses that we read again last week, I'd like to read them again before we look at these lessons. Second uh, Timothy 4, verse 17 and 18. Wonderful, wonderful verses. I hope you get in encouraged by it. I hope you are challenged by it. And I hope you have faith for what God will do in your life as well. Second Timothy 4, verse 17. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished. This was Paul saying, I stood in the gap. I was... Uh, I, I allowed God to use me. I was that man. In order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed. Put your name there, dear brother, dear sister. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, the first faith lesson I, I, I learned here, and there's probably many others, I'm sure you could uh, share some of those yourself, but this is one thing I learned and I saw from the example of Paul, is that Christ came to save sinners and to use us as an example of His grace. Christ came to save sinners. When you think about whom God would pick to stand in the gap, I'm looking for a man, I'm looking for a woman. He's not looking for those who have it all together. And I hope that's good news for you. He's not looking for those who never did a wrong thing in their life, those who didn't make a mess of their lives, those who didn't make wrong choices. No. You see that in the example of Paul. Let's look at this. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. This man of God who could say at the end of these letters, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, I have fought the good fight. This same man, listen to how he starts writing these letters. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. Considered me faithful. He says, well, Paul, that's pretty arrogant of you to say that God considered you faithful. He says, well, he considered me faithful, putting into service who? Even though, verse 13, I was formerly a blasphemer. He's telling Timothy and he's telling us through that. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Look at the life of Paul. I could pick somebody who was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. He was the original terrorist, if you will. That's what a violent aggressor is. He was out to get God's people. A blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. And yet, I was shown mercy. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was more than abundant. I was so hopeless. That's how abundant the grace of our Lord Jesus was. With the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And then he says these powerful words. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and to employ them in the building of his kingdom. It's like Jesus told the Pharisees, I didn't come for the healthy. If you feel like you have it all together and everything's great, that maybe Christ didn't come for you. But if you feel like you're hopeless, if you feel like you were hopeless at some point, Maybe God has done wonderful works in your life. That's great. But if you remember and you, you know that you were one of these, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, then good news for, me, for you, dear brother, dear sister. God says, I want you to be the one to stand in the gap. Not somebody who did everything right and had everything all together. Not, not the healthy, like Jesus told the Pharisees, but those who were sick, who needed a doctor, whom Christ came and restored back to health, gave them his resurrection power. He says, now stand in the gap. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Why? For this reason, that I, for this reason I found mercy, in order that in me as the worst, that's what I think foremost means there, in me as the worst, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience. In me as the worst. Do you feel like the worst? Do you feel like if there's anybody that shouldn't be, who doesn't deserve to get into God's kingdom, it's you. Then there's good news. God took such a man, the worst, in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe. This is how we stand in the gap. Recognizing that we were sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world to save me, a sinner, among whom I'm foremost, and says, now you let me clean you up, and I'll use you as an example of my grace. Similar words in Ephesians. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Also Paul writing. Ephesians 
Ephesians 2 verse 1. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It doesn't get more hopeless than dead. You know, I mean, you talk about hopeless, it's dead. It's over when it's dead, right? I mean, I was thinking even in the context of the recent uh, situation in Boston, the, the, the situation was over when the one guy died and then they caught the other person. Now, if both of them were dead, it would really be over. Nothing more to be afraid of. They're dead. The danger is over. That's what he says about you and I. You and I, he says, you were dead. You were beyond hope in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, Ephesians 2 verse 1. Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. If you weren't quite dead yet, if, there was, if it wasn't quite hopeless yet, then God was waiting for it to become hopeless enough. Uh, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that, and this is what I was trying to get to, why did he do that? Why did he show me such mercy? Why did he pick me up when I was dead? In the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved by faith. This is the reason he showered his mercy. This is the reason why he pours grace into your life now. Because not just in this lifetime, but even in ages to come. I picture an eternity. God bragging to the angels on his grace and using you as an example. You brother, you sister, you man of God, you woman of God. Looking out upon creation, you know, God likes to admire his work. He did that in, uh, in Genesis 1 and 2. He looked at his creation and said, it's very, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. I imagine God doing that in the ages to come as well. It's good. Look at the work I did. Look at where I picked up this wretched chief of sinners, among whom he, uh, the uh, sinner, foremost of sinners, and look at where I brought him. If you will have faith. Now, if you think your situation is hopeless and you think, well, Lord, you can't do anything with me. God says, okay, unfortunately, I can't do it with you, but I wish you would see how great I am and how I want to manifest in ages to come the surpassing, surpassing, just overflowing, like stretch them as wide as you can, riches of his graces, of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I put this song up there. Um, maybe you can follow along with me. This is a hymn that's not as well known. Wonderful words, though. Shows why we are privileged as human beings. And that God, you know when the angels fell? Have you thought about this? When, when Lucifer and the other uh, angels fell and became demons, God never made a way of salvation for them. They were cursed for eternity. They are demons to this day because of that fall. But he saw you and I, human beings, in Adam falling, Adam and Eve falling. And he says, I want to make a way of salvation for them. This is a song angels can't sing. Angels never knew the joy that is mine. For the blood has never washed their sins away. Although they sing in heaven, there will come a time when silently they listen to me sing amazing grace. For it's a song holy angels cannot sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's a song holy angels cannot sing. I once was lost, but now am found. Holy is the Lord, the angels sing, before the throne of God continually. For me to join that choir would be a natural thing, but they just won't know the words, love lifted me. For it's a song holy angels cannot sing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It's a so song holy angels cannot sing. I once was lost, but now I am found. If you have tasted of the Lord's mercy, and he has poured his grace on your life, dear brother, dear sister, give yourself to him. Be that man of God. Be that woman of God who is devoted completely to his kingdom. The second le lesson I'd like to show you, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This lesson, live with abandon to Jesus, because Jesus lived with abandon to you. You know what I mean by living with abandon? That means that you, you don't hold back anything. You don't have a backup option. You don't have a fallback plan if God fails. Is that how you trust God? That you've put all of it. It's like putting all, you know, they say, financial counselors say, don't put all of your money into one bank because it could fail. Spread it, you know, distribute your, um, your portfolio. They talk about that. Distribute it because this one might fail. Let me ask you, your spiritual portfolio, is it distributed? Is your confidence and your rest on earth right now because you have certain amount in your bank account and you have a job and your confidence is in your employer or in your the medicines you take or in something else the fact that you're healthy today that's a backup option 
And the Lord, in His mercy, will actually perhaps bring you to the place where all of that fails. And the things that you have relied on fall apart so that He can show you who are you really trusting on. He wants you to rely on Him. And yes, He will use, the, your paycheck may still come from your employer, but you'll realize that it comes from the giver of all good things, like we sang this morning. He is the one who has allowed me to have this job and allows my employer to give me payment. You see the rest it brings in my heart? Now if my employer shortchanges me, it hasn't changed the fact that all of my spiritual portfolio is in God. I'm trusting Him. I'm living with abandon to Him because He, is he gave Himself with abandon to me. Do you know that He did that? When it says, let me show you Romans chapter 8. When it says in John 3.16, you know this famous verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only. Just pause there for a moment. He gave His only. God had an only begotten Son that none of us should perish, but that we should have eternal life. And then He says in Romans 8.31, What then shall we say to these things? This is a, a lesson in faith. If God is for us, who can be against us? Why? He didn't even spare His own Son. He gave with abandon. He did not even spare his own son, but delivered it up, delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? This is the God who loves with abandon and gives himself to any who will trust him with that abandon. And now he says, why do you want to hold back the little bit that you have? And you think, well, Lord, I'm, I want to keep this for myself. I want to look out for my own interests. He looks to you to love him with abandon. 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is what he says, you know, those of you who are rich towards God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world. And actually, it doesn't matter how poor you might be, where you are in the financial spectrum in this, in the, in this country, you're still pretty rich. Every single one of us is rich compared to most of the rest of the world. And so we all fit into this category. Instruct those who are rich in this present world. You have food, you have clothing, you have shelter, you have a job, you have means to provide for your family, no matter what your financial need. He says, those who are rich in this present world, don't be conceited, not, nor to fix their hope on the uncertainty of this thing. Is your security and your certainty in your job or in the fact that you have some savings account? No, it's good to have savings account. Don't get me wrong. But my, my hope is not fixed on that. Not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works. This is the riches of heaven. Be rich towards God. Be lavish towards God. Whatever He asks of you, be lavish towards Him and His purpose. And then you've understood what it means to have faith in God. Think of that verse uh, from that hymn, Isaac Watts' hymn, but it's up there. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. You know, there have been many times when I've been reminded of my sin and the ways I've let God down, and I weep. And it's good to weep. You know, there's a, a godly sorrow that reads, leads to repentance. The Bible talks about it. And it's good to weep. Uh, David describes it as his, he's swimming in his bed because he's his tears he's just crying i think it's psalm 6 he's crying and crying it's like his whole bed is swimming with his tears that's how much he weeps this is a man after god's own heart and it's good to have that weeping but that alone does not meet the sacrifice that god requests of us and requires of us what is the sacrifice i beseech you brethren by the mercies of god present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god this is your spiritual service of worship where is the where are those tears meaningful where, when you cry at night over the sin in your life or in some morning and, and you're really convicted, for me it usually happens when I'm reminded of the sacrifice Christ made for me and what it costs for me to have a hope of salvation and a hope of eternity and I see Christ hanging on the cross for me as if I was the only sinner. And then I weep over my own selfishness and the, the selfishness that is still there in my flesh and I repent of it before the Lord. But you know the consequence of that is it's proven when later on I'm tested to give my life away. Those drops of grief, those drops of grief will never repay the debt of love I owe. What will? Nothing can, but he says, this is what I ask of you. Give yourself away. Here, Lord, I give myself away. It is all that I can do. The last faith lesson I'll share with you here is look to the promiser, not the answer. Look to the one who has promised, not to the answer. 
And this, you know, I haven't thought about this much, and I'm, I'm still delving into it. Maybe the Lord will reveal something to you during this week. But I know that very often when I pray in faith and I ask God for something very specific, I'm looking for the answer. He says, okay, Lord, I've asked for that now. When are you going to give me that answer? When are you going to give me that answer? When are you going to give me that answer? And often when I don't get the answer the way I want it, all of a sudden I'm discouraged and think, well, Lord, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and, and you didn't answer because my eye was on the answer. And when you pray in faith, whatever it might be, whether it's physical healing, um, help in a financial difficulty, whether it's a spiritual struggle, even a sin, a besetting sin perhaps. Perhaps it's a habit that, that is controlling you. Don't let your eye be on that answer. Look to the promiser. Let me show you this verse in uh, Romans 4 where it talks about Abraham. Abraham is a great example of this, but it, it says it pretty clearly here in these verses in Romans 4. It says, Romans uh, 4, let's say, begin verse 17, As it was written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So what did Abraham do? In hope against hope, when all hope was gone, when it was completely hopeless, he believed. He had faith in order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, you know that Abraham had to pray for a long time and he had to believe for a long time before he saw any promise, any sign of promise at all, any sign of answer. He prayed and prayed and he believed God and he believed God, but without becoming weak in faith, the delay that God allowed before the answer happened didn't result in Abraham's faith being weakened. But you see how that's often the opposite in our lives? I can testify to that. That when God delays the answer to my prayer, my faith gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. If, my, if I'm looking to God, now if I'm looking to the answer, yes. Well, you know, hope deferred makes the soul sick. And so, man, I'm waiting for my answer. I'm waiting for my answer. Lord, when's the answer? That will weaken your faith. But when you're looking to God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the unchanging God, your faith will never get weakened. In fact, it will probably get stronger. You will see the situation seem, seemingly get more and more hopeless. It will seem like that job that you're after, there's no sign of any job at all, and you're, but your eyes are fixed on God. And this is what's strengthening your faith. This is what's encouraging your faith. Around you, people will be looking at circumstances and their faith will be weakened. But Abraham, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his body. He took one look at his body. Uh, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. And then he took one look at the deadness of Sarah's womb. But with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. He says, I'm not going to shake. You're God. You'll fulfill it. Now, he did waver before that, I think, with Hagar, and he thought he had to help God out. But here it says that he did not waver with God. He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. This is the challenge I see Paul giving Timothy as well. Grow strong in the faith. Keep the faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Grow strong in it. Keep your eyes on the promise, sir, not the answer but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. You know, you know what the promise for Abraham was? It wasn't just one seed. It wasn't just one son. It was the uh, descendants like the uh, sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. I have a question for you. Did Abraham live to see the fulfillment of that promise exactly as God had promised him? He says, your descendants shall be as the sand and as the, as the stars. When Abraham died, I think he had maybe three or four, we don't know. He had another wife, Keturah, later on. But certainly through Sarah, this was the only child he had. One. But he didn't waver in promise. Was, his, was that promise to God fulfilled? Absolutely. Happened long after Abraham was dead and gone. You see that God's promise, if you're based your, your, your faith in God in his word, if, you're based, if your faith in God is based in his word, the promise he has made for your life extends beyond your physical lifetime. And so often we think, well, Lord, I'm giving you a time frame in which to answer my prayer. I have faith that by tomorrow you will do this. And we put God in a box and say, I expect you to do this. And God says, no, I'm working on something that's much greater than even your lifetime, let alone these two hours or two months in which you've given me to answer your prayer. I'm doing something greater than that. One of the best examples I have of this is that I read in the biography of George Mueller. If you ever want to know what faith is like, study the, the life of George Mueller, read his, about his life. But I heard this story, and from what I know, it's true, because he talks about it himself. About 50 years before he died, he lived in the late 1800s, mid, mid to late 1800s. 
he, the Lord really impressed on him to pray for five individuals that they would be born again. They were not believers, and so the Lord impressed on him that he would pray for these five people. And I think uh, after a couple years, the first person got born again. Mueller sees the answer to his prayer. He keeps praying. About five years later, the second person gets born again, and he's excited. About six years later, the third person gets born again. And then it seemingly things go silent. Another 50 years go by, and these two last people that he was praying for, they were the, the grown sons of a friend of his, I think, d didn't seem to get born again. And what happened? It, uh, George Miller died in 1898. But the way the story goes, apparently verified by biographers, sometime later, those two men also came to know the Lord. You see that Mueller's prayer and his faith didn't mean, well, Lord, I, it's been 50 years and you still have, you answered those three. What about the other two? He didn't waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. This is an example of a man in our generation almost within the last 100, 200 years who had that kind of a faith. My dear brother, dear sister, do you have a faith that will outlive your life? Then you understand the kind of faith that God expects of us. Trust him. I mean, you may, I know, I, I, I speak this from the burning passion of my heart because I, saw, I see so often, it's like the Lord allowed me to play back scenes in my past of where I says, Lord, I'm expecting you to answer. And I thought he didn't answer because I ran out of time. He, God hasn't run out of time. You're still alive. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart in unbelief. Trust God and believe that he will do a miracle. And this is especially applicable, my dear. Now, be, be sure that we can't just claim whatever we want. I can't say, well, Lord, you're going to give me a new car, a new house. If it's, if it's based on God's word, sin shall not have dominion over you, Romans 6, 14. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how long you wrestle with it. God will give you the victory if you have faith. If you're under grace, sin will not have dominion over you. Hold on to that, dear friend, dear brother, dear sister. I want to read this last poem. Is, maybe you've seen it before. About feeling faith and fact. And it's very often that our faith is affected by feelings. You, because our, we tend to look at the things of this earth. And I, I'm full of faith. And then all of a sudden these feelings start to creep in. And I think that God's really not on my side. And all of a sudden faith just drains. My faith drains. I hope you can relate to that. I've been there. And the, the temptation, that's why Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Fight it. Fight that battle that your faith does not fail like Jesus prayed for Peter. Three men were walking on a wall. Feeling, faith, and fact. When feeling took an awful fall and faith was taken aback, so close was faith to feeling, he stumbled and fell too. Feeling fell and faith kind of fell too. But fact remained and pulled faith back and faith brought feelings to, feeling too. Interesting little way of putting it. Fact is this. This is what we know is fact. This is God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away, Jesus said. This is fact. Let your faith be based in this. Faith comes from hearing the word of Christ, it says in Romans chapter 10. If your faith is based in this, and what the Holy Spirit ministers to you, as we've seen, every scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for, repu for, re for reproof, for rebuke, and all of those things, for correction, for instruction and godliness, that the man of God, that's you, to stand in the gap, woman of God, that's you, to stand in the, go in the gap, might be fully equipped. Let your faith be based on this, and then the feelings will come. Feelings might go, but don't let faith be dragged down or dragged this way or that by the way your feelings go. God's word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Father, I pray that you will remind us of these things, Lord, as we need them. Make these words practical and living in our, in our lives. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us fact, Lord, your word that we can base our, our, our confidence on. And help us, Lord, to look to you, the promiser, not to the things of this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Santosh. Um, it, was, it was good to hear from the Lord again. And uh, those are some good examples for us. Anybody else have any testimonies they want to share or anything?